the topic of the conference is waking up out of the cave. <laughs> so my, my concern is how people think about waking up. What does it mean for you waking up or what you feel when I ask you what is waking up? <laughs> okay, it's, it's 10 o'clock or 10.30 on California coast and uh, about an hour ago, maybe a little bit more, I woke up. I feel quite woken up because Pierre Luigi entered my whatever it was, a dream, but I didn't dream him, and now I see him. So we are both uh, hopefully woken up. And what it means is then that we share the world. We share the world with others. We share with the world with people like us. We share the world with people who have consciousness. Just to recognize it, that other people are like you. They are conscious. They feel. They they have a, a sense of pain, a sense of joy. They they can think, you know. And we all share the same world that we have to take care of. That's I think is a good content to waking up. But then there is another content to waking up, and people mean it by recognizing who they are. And uh, that's of course the most ancient and most religious also connotation to the world, uh, to the world. And uh, I think that it's also valid, and uh, that's that's important to do so because when they, you're woken up to the self, as Panishad says, then only all of this becomes known. So uh, waking up to oneself and waking up to the world is connected, obviously. Don't you feel strange that the ancient tradition, all them speak about waking up, the Buddha and the Upanishad, as you said, the Vedanta and, and, and the Zen, and in a, in a modern psychology the term is uh, forgotten nobody speak about uh, waking up in our tradition in our psychology yeah i think that uh, you are touching on a very important point here and that is what psychology usually does and what it doesn't do and uh, uh, maybe psychology is not fit to capture the answers to the main questions of human existence and while it's trying so hard, it's at the same time is not something we can rely upon in, in making our choices. And uh, that transpersonal psychology may be different in that sense. But I believe that you are talking about the regular psychology, which deals with human, human sorrows and human uh, adaptation and, uh, and survival maybe at some point. But uh, we are talking about human emancipation and uh, about limits of knowledge, whether we can push the limits of knowledge beyond uh, Kantian uh, limitations, the mind, that's, of course, is corresponding to the term waking up. And if you think to your life, which kind of experience you would say that they were uh, most important for waking up in your life, for your awakening? So, uh, well, maybe we can say it this way. When we look into the world, at others look out, away from their self. This is a consensus experience. We will have agree uh, to agree on certain consciousness, certainly gain limitations of knowledge. Uh, it can be said that one has to look never looked before. It's, it's a little bit like Star Trek in that sense, but it's just becoming very emotional because it's you and it's alive. Then you acquire a sense to yourself, which is timeless and limitless and all knowledge and uh, at the same time, it's very human. That's the point that a sphere or sense that comes into your awareness. And then it never goes away because it's constant. It can't go away. It's timeless. So uh, some people call that waking up. But then again, it gets different dependent on the tradition. There is a sense of self to it, but it's not a self which is egotistic or has certain desires but just a constancy to one's existence, which I think is the essence of that experience. But it can be different, different for everybody. I yes, think. this is the reason why I ask for, for you. If you try to remember your life and you can say, this was something important for waking up to me. This was something important that happens that changed my vision or make the difference. 
<laughs> well, you're asking a very profound question. Yeah, uh, I like profundity. It's a very personal question. The first time when I was exposed to Vedanta, it was through the teacher called Robert Adams. He was a direct student of Sri Ramana Maharshi, and he lived in Los Angeles and gave satsang. What he spoke about seemed very obvious, very obvious that that's how just how things are, and that's what universe is. And then uh, there were many, many doubts, and I... I realized that it's very difficult to get that uh, essence, that constant essence of the self that uh, he was talking about. And then uh, one day I locked myself in a hotel. It was in Santa Fe, uh, in a hotel room. And I thought, well, I won't leave that room until I understand very clearly and personally what he means. I spent three days on that hotel carpet on in on the floor in the room in a sort of retreat, just turning to back onto myself. And what I discovered there was a lot lots of emotions. There was just this emotional cushion which masked that subjectivity uh, I was trying to answer, uh, access. And so I was crying and crying and uh, been scared and then was just trying to get through. And then it stopped. It's sort of like uh, the veil uh, removed itself or maybe it stayed there, but it became irrelevant. <clears throat> so there was some uh, meditative, some uh, concentration effort, and there was a lot of trying and a lot of emotion, but it never stops in the sense that the levels of understanding consciousness, they, they grow and they deepen. And what I realized, I think that 20, 25 years after that first uh, experience is that I'm quite curious or even more curious to know what the universe is. Because, you know, with this or that, you know, degree of effort, one can gain that constancy. But then the questions which concern the universe and the nature of the world and the nature of our civilization, why it is that we are so advanced on one hand and so deluded the other, and whether we took all the right turns in our history, whether compassion is really uh, something that we can rely upon, or the only thing we have is really animal behaviors. And, you know, all these questions, they don't go away with awakening. And in order for awakening to be stable, we have to realize or to figure out some answers to these questions as well. That's the most challenging thing. You know, because you can be awakened, or I can be awakened, and know nothing, absolutely nothing. The situation with awakening is that we are part of the world, and that what we realize in ourselves is perception. Perception, we are connected to everything there is. If we don't know what that is, then our perception is ignorant. So that creates a difficulty in uh, the post uh, period of awakening. So, you know, the, the recent uh, experiences with pandemic and uh, seeing how people behave and then now what the world is like, they were very awakening for me, very transformative. Thank you a lot for this answer because, uh, as you said, it was deep deep and personal and you enter these and you explain it very well. I like so much stories of person, you know, and this was a, a very nice story, very important to, to, to listen to the story of other... Thank you very much. And I have to mm -hmm. say that I'm very, very curious. Uh, and I know that besides sharing in awakening, in transpersonal psychology and other beautiful things, we are also both doctors. So I would just absolutely, I'm so curious. <laughs> I want to ask you so many questions, but on the other side, I don't want to hijack the... The last one, what you should uh, suggest for young people in direction of this awakening or in direction of the connection with the self, uh, which could be the most important message for, for the young generation? Well, okay. Uh, you know, I just recently wrote a piece which was very... Yeah nostalgic about the practice of nonviolence, figuring out intellectually some kind of frame of reference which would allow one to be internally peaceful and become a conduit of that in the world is very difficult because mind is either that way or this way. It always has opinions. It has dialectics. It always 
negates itself and then argues with itself when one realizes that essence of selfhood, when that becomes available in experience, uh, you have a point of reference in yourself which is constant, which you can always hold on to in any turbulence, in any decision-making. It also has an interesting uh, effect of uh, stabilizing your whole mind, of helping you to gain answers to all the questions, because in some very strange way, it harmonizes individual mind uh, with the totality of the social world and, and larger world and other people. It serves as, as an anchor. And, uh, you know, the metaphor is uh, like a hawk who flies high in the sky, or, you know, flies over the mountains. And I'm looking at the mountains here in the window, and I often see them. Uh, these birds, eagles, and hawks, you know, who are soaring very high in the sky and they see everything and they hunt sometimes, but they always return to that point of reference, which is either their nest or a hand of the person who trains them. So when when you have that field, that reference point uh, in yourself, it's a point of certainty which one can return to. And from that vista, take action, or look at the world, or relate to other people, or see how alien is violence and violent solutions. One becomes a safer human being to deal with in that situation. So you you are less of a nuisance to other people, if that is realized. And so, uh, and I think because of that, it's very important to find that essence. Also, forgive me, I'm, it's allergy season here, so the realities of life are kicking in. But there is, you know, a big talk nowadays in press and in, in uh, well, at least here in the American media, uh, about who is woke, who is not, and what kind of identity people take on, what kind of gender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you don't have, if one doesn't have an anchor in oneself, then this ocean of passion is going just simply to knock you down and make you crazy. And it's never possible to figure out who you are because it changes together with the world unless one gets that anchor of stability. So I think there is no miracle with it, but uh, there is a great practical use uh, which comes out of it. And that, of course, comes out of meditation and this effort to know oneself and practicing all kinds of internal disciplines, self-reflection and self-awareness and everything else, including even taking care of your health and exercising and etc. Ethical scrutiny. Olga, this moved me because it was so authentic and lived, <laughs> something lived, you know, something that go directly to, to heart. So thank you so much for uh, what well, you thank said. You, thank you very much, Pierluigi. When you, you know, when you told me what the topic is, I was uh, afraid. I thought, oh my God, is he going to ask me about semantics, so all this different context, but uh, it was straightforward and very to the point, and I am very, very glad that I could see you and we could connect around. Maybe we can say hello today, because I guess that a lot of people will be there listening to you on, uh, on our gathering, so... <laughs> Okay, well, let's connect, let's send our hearts to the Thanks. audience.